Okay, I think we get started. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I hope you're enjoying uh, uh, the, the conference. I'm certainly enjoying the, uh, the weather in Sydney. For those of you who don't know, I've just relocated from uh, Sydney to uh, Dubai via Boston, and Boston was a little too cold. Uh, Dubai is a little too hot, and Sydney's just right, so it's nice to be back. Um, I've been involved with all three of these events, and it's been a really, really useful kind of like examination of a process in action, uh, both in contributing to original thoughts leading to the interim report, evaluating that interim report, uh, and now basically having some considered thoughts about in, what are the issues in relation to implementation. And of course, this prompts the regulators uh, first uh, and foremost in poll position, but as the report makes clear, it is up to industry to take this as an opportunity to change. And that opportunity to change is an opportunity which I think there is now no option but to take. So I do a lot of work on scandal, and so the latest scandal that I'm uh, looking into is HSBC. And it's kind of interesting when you look when you look back at HSBC's statements at the height of the global financial crisis, and of course HSBC weathered the storm much better than many others, but was one of the interesting things was a, uh, uh, something that was in the annual report of HSBC for 2009, in which Stephen Green, the CEO, noted that throughout the crisis our strategy has remained clear to build on our position as the leading international and emerging markets bank. And we have also never forgotten that it is our responsibility to make a real contribution to economic and social development. And that our ability to do so is fundamental to our success in delivering sustainable value to our shareholders. Meeting our commitments to the communities we serve around the world is not some optional extra or byproduct of our business it is part of our raison d'etre. Clearly not applicable to Mexican drug cartels, clearly not applicable in Swiss private banking. That's a real problem for HSBC, but it's also a real problem for how we rebuild trust and how we rebuild confidence in our markets. And I think that was one of the critical issues faced by the FSI. So the structure of this session is that we will have some initial comment commentary from uh, Professor Kevin Davis, a member of the FSI panel, then followed by five-minute opening statements from our two financial regulators, and then we'll open it up to some moderated discussion, and moderated discussion will then open up into uh, conversation with you, uh, the participants in this symposium. Um, if you are going to ask a question, we would ask you to stand up, wait till the microphone comes to you, and please give us your name and your affiliation. This is not a use of big data, but it is a use to basically help uh, in the television uh, production that we are putting together. So with that, I'll hand over to Kevin Davis uh, from the FSI. This morning he talked about the metaphor of a car, uh, and what, he wanted to, what the FSI wanted to do was figure out, you know, is the car roadworthy, is it fit for purpose? I suppose that opens the question of where you want the car to go to. Kevin. I'm looking for what's worth. Um, let me uh, start. I said this morning that uh, uh, a couple of aspects of the way in which the inquiry proceeded. One was being cognizant of the various things we've learnt from both uh, uh, research and uh, uh, and also experience, uh, and out of that uh, comes the need for strong regulators. So we can't be sure that the system will necessarily be resilient. Uh, we can't be sure that consumers will get the outcomes that we want them to have. So there is a need for, for strong regulators and a good regulatory framework uh, that works well, but that also, you know, we're very, again, very cognizant of the compliance costs of regulation that regulation that uh, is designed to solve some problems ha can have spillover effects on others. Um, I almost slipped into saying unintended consequences. One of the things you might, if you read through the, both the interim report and the final report, you'll see that 
I managed to stop the Secretary of putting unintended consequences in there anywhere. We managed to avoid that term because I think that's always used as a, you know, a knockdown argument because um, we don't know what, it is, what the outcomes are. Anyway, uh, going, getting back on theme. Uh, in terms of the, the, the approach we took, the other aspect of, of, a, uh, of the approach in terms of being pragmatic was, again, to start from what we have and ask the question, is there a strong case to shift from what we have? Um, this gets back to the don't, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And I guess in that regard, it's probably worth saying, what are some of the things we didn't do that several people might have recommended? And in terms of how they account to the regulatory agencies. And some of the submissions would have said, uh, sorry Wayne, put APRA back with the Reserve Bank. Uh, we looked at that uh, uh, possibility and thought, well, no, I mean, you, you could, but there's no strong argument that says doing it the way we have at the moment, uh, having the structure we have at the moment uh, isn't appropriate. Um, there's also the possibility that, repeated, we could have taken the uh, uh, con financial consumer protection responsibilities and given them to the ACCC. Um, or some other suggestions were that you might set up a separate agency, as has happened in a number of countries overseas, in the US and Canada, I think in the UK as well. Um, but a number of countries have set up separate financial consumer protection boards. Again, we looked at it and thought, well, they're all options. There are arguments for and against. But on balance, and these things ultimately come down to an on-balance uh, uh, judgment, I think. Uh, there was no strong argument for changing what we had there. Another area where there were various suggestions about how we might change the, the structure of the regulatory agencies uh, would have, was in the context of the um, Council of Financial Regulators. Um, a number of people suggested that that should be formalised. Um, again, we looked at those arguments, debated them, uh, said it's worked pretty well up to now. Uh, does it need to be formalised? A number of the arguments overseas were that uh, uh, if you get a financial crisis, you sort of need to handball responsibility from one party to another as you go through a financial crisis. Uh, but again, our, our feeling was the current system has worked well on that. Uh, we don't need to formalise it as a, uh, a statutory uh, body with particular responsibilities and, and so on, but it operates well as it currently does. So there were a number of things that we didn't do in the context of the, the structure of the regulatory agencies on the grounds that, yes, you could argue for it, but on balance we were, we were comfortable with where we, uh, where we currently were. I guess the areas where we, we, we did make decisions in, the, in terms of the structure of the regulatory agencies and inter interrelationships between them um, relate to the, the, per the perception that we need strong regulators, we need to give them appropriate, appropriate powers. We need, I guess I can refer back to my analogy this morning, we need the traffic cops and the, and the police uh, to actually have quality people and appropriate powers and so on, and certainty of funding. So there's a number of, um, of recommendations in the, the report about the nature of funding, uh, the, the, the quantum of funding, the ability to uh, uh, to attract uh, appropriate people in competition with the people you're trying to regulate. Um, so there's a number of those types of uh, regulations. Um, there's also the question of what is it the regulators are supposed, supposed to do? So again, there's discussion in the report and recommendations about the mandates that governments give to the regulators uh, and the regulators' response on, on those. Make sure that they're clear and in particular make sure that the importance of regulators being aware of the consequences of their decisions for competition in the marketplace uh, is understood. Of course, to the extent that you give, and, and sorry, also another thing, we, I, think, I guess we reaffirmed the importance of independence of regulators, that our, our system works, works well in that, in that regard. Um, of course, if you're going to have independent regulators, uh, well-resourced with significant powers, you need accountability as well. And that's where we came up with the suggestion that uh, a financial, regula financial regulator account, FRAB, whatever, whatever, whatever those initials stand for, uh, uh, a, a separate board to perform the, uh, an annual role of assessing how well the regulators have, have performed their mandate uh, to the extent they've taken into account competition and so on. 
uh, as a way of providing that, that accountability mechanism in hopefully an, an, efficient w uh, an efficient way. And I'm sure we'll talk more about that later okay, on. Okay, well, we'll come into the detail of the Financial Regulatory uh, Regulators Assessment Board uh, in a moment. But let's get to the overarching picture from the two financial regulators. Uh, we're embarrassed from APRA. Uh, well, thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Justin, and thank you to CIFA for the opportunity to be here as part of this uh, panel today. Um, let me start with a couple of general comments about the FSI and then I'll drill into some of the more specific recommendations. I think um, my take, and uh, I'll speak on behalf of APRA obviously, our take is it's actually a very balanced package of recommendations overall. Um, there can be a tendency for us all to delve into one and dissect some of them in isolation, but when, when you look at it as a, as a complete package, it's, it's actually um, quite a balanced, sensible direction uh, overall, and I say that, or I would say that, even if you weren't on the panel, Kevin, I, I think it's um, it, it's uh, well, it's consistent with many of the submissions we put in to start with. So I can't really argue anything else. But I think more generally, it's it's a quite balanced uh, package of reforms. And to to make the point, um, I'll repeat the point that Kevin just made. I think it, it is a good endorsement of the existing financial system. Uh, regulatory system. Um, I don't pretend there's a perfect regulatory model uh, and I would never seek to export our model to other jurisdictions. These things have to be designed in the context of the, 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 uh, the government framework, the financial system and what works in an individual jurisdiction. But I think our framework that was set up post the Wallace inquiry has actually served as well. The evidence is it's, it's served as well. Um, not to say it can't be improved, and many of the recommendations are about improving it, but certainly we didn't think there was a case uh, that any fundamental rejig of the responsibilities was actually guaranteed to deliver a significantly better outcome. And so we're quite obviously quite comfortable with where the, the panel came out to on that. Um, drilling into the, the, the chapter on the, the regulatory system, as Kevin said, at its foundation, it's essentially saying for the benefit of the Australian community, for the benefit of, of attracting investment and generating growth, there is a need for strong, independent and accountable regulators within the system. Um, now, it won't surprise you that Peter and I say, of course, that's important um, because that's our job and we, we think it's important. Um, but there can be often a debate, and there was some debate when, we, when, the, uh, the, the, when the FSI was going, that sort of positioned regulators as a cost and only as a cost. And um, I think it, it, it's important that regulators do their job well, but, but if they do their job well, then they're actually a value add, and, and we have to recognise that. Um, and the easiest way to do that is to say, uh, let's imagine Peter and I went back to the office this afternoon and we just shut our organisations down and we all left. What would be the reaction of the community? Would the financial system work as well as it should? Would people have confidence? No, it, it, there would, it would introduce inefficiencies and, and frictions into the system um, which uh, would not be for the good of, of the community. Now, that's not to say you go to the other end of the spectrum and all regulation therefore is beneficial. There's a balance to be had here, but it's important to recognise there's a value add that comes from, from good regulation and I think that's, what the, uh, that's really what the panel was driving at, is how do we make sure that we get that balance that balance right. Um, if I comment on a couple of the, the specific recommendations and particularly the, the, the so-called FRAB, which is a very dour sounding <laughs> body, um, maybe it's a dour subject, but it's, um, uh, again, I think when you look at the package that's been presented here, as Kevin said, it, you need to look at these things side by side Independence has to come with accountability. Uh, I don't think you'd get any disagreement at all from, from anyone in APRA or ASIC. That's, uh, it's appropriate that you have those two things and it's dangerous to have all of one and none of the other, whichever end of the spectrum you're at. So these two things have to go um, 
uh, have to go hand in hand and, and certainly our submissions which we made to the FSI certainly acknowledged you can't have the independence without having very strong accountability mechanisms. Uh, but when you get to the accountability mechanisms and you get to things like the, the new assessment board, the devil is sort of always in the detail and exactly how we design this is going to be very important because there are all sorts of checks and balances that already exist on regulators and they're entirely appropriate, you know, reporting to parliament, appearing before parliamentary committees, the statement of expectations and statement of intent, the need to put things through the Office of Best Practice Regulation, the fact that our standards can be disallowed by parliament, our decisions reviewed by courts. All of these things exist to make sure that, that the independence that we have is properly used. Um, so there are a whole raft of things that exist. There's some new things that have emerged in the last little while, uh, separate or in parallel to the financial system inquiry, uh, regulator performance framework, a new, um, uh, new acts under which the, the regulatory agencies are governed. So when we think about the design of the, the new board, and, and we, let me say quite clearly, we don't have any in principle objection to the, the new board, but what's really important is to think about the design, not in a very narrow sense of how would we set this board up, but how does it fit within this broader accountability framework and how will it dovetail with all of the other mechanisms? How can it help strengthen some of those other mechanisms uh, and avoid the risk that if it's thought about just in isolation as just something else we stack on the pile, uh, potentially it becomes something of a bureaucratic exercise and doesn't actually add the value that I think the panel was hoping that it would add. Um, two other quick comments uh, on funding. Obviously it won't surprise you that I think funding of regulators is important and adequate funding of regulators is important. But I think um, I don't say that just because you know, we, we would all wish we were less resource constrained than we are, whether in the public or the private sector, we always wish we could we could have a little bit more. Um, because I think what's, what's actually critical in an Australian context and particularly in an APRA context is we, we have tried to run what we call a supervision-led approach. Uh, the, the actual cheapest way to regulate anything from a government bottom line perspective is black letter law. Because you just need someone to write the law, issue it and you're done. You just apply it to everybody and that's it. That's cheap. Um, but it's not necessarily effective and quite often it has, it can be burdensome, it's not tailored, it's not risk-based, it's not proportionate, all of those things that we would actually think good regulation is. So uh, we think a strength of our framework and the framework that APRA has applied over many years and the Reserve Bank tried to apply before that is a very much a supervision-led approach, uh, but supervision requires judgments judgments require experienced people and experienced people cost money and that's so it's very important that we have this regular check as the FSI proposed uh, that the regulators have the capabilities they need to deliver on the frameworks that they have. Um, my last uh, comment quickly on competition um, is uh, I don't have any concerns with the perspectives that the FSI put which is we should uh, increase the prominence that we give to considerations around competition. I, I think that's perfectly fine and perfectly sensible. Um, the only thing I would perhaps say in thinking about this issue is we shouldn't pretend that competition and stability are mutually exclusive or that we necessarily have to trade off one or the other. Um, you know, like all things, if you have too much or too little of something, you, it's often a bad result. Um, it's possible to have too much competition. Indeed, you, you know, look at what happened to a number of global banks, uh, 2006, 2007, the, the, um, the philosophy of if the music's playing, you've got to get up and dance, even if you know it's not really sensible. We have HIH experience closer to home, very competitive organisation until it drove itself into the ground. So we need to not be at either end of the spectrum is really the point. And um, we shouldn't think that there has to be a trade-off. Sustainable competition 
will also deliver financial stability and that's really in the best interest of everybody. So let me finish, finish that. Before I go, go, go on to, to Peter, can I just ask you in relation to, to the operation of FRAB then, I mean, do you think is there a danger then, if not appropriately designed, FRAB offers an opportunity for industry to second guess the judgment of the regulator? Uh, yes, I guess so. Um, but that's no different to saying any poorly designed framework or structural regulation could have a bad outcome. But FRAB uh, does give industry a privileged voice. Uh, well, I don't know. It depends on how it's set up and who sits on it yeah. and, and the mechanisms mm. by which the, you know, the, the assessment board forms its view. Does it form its view? What voice does the regulator have to respond to the issues and get you know, a balanced, um, if there's a concern that it's one-sided, how do you get the balance right? All of those things, I think, can be mitigated if you have good okay. design. So the key is the design. The key is design. Okay, uh, let's bring Peter in. Uh, thanks very much, Justin, and thanks to CIFA for, uh, for another very good workshop. As we've heard from Kevin and Wayne, the FSI report contains a very wide set of recommendations that, that touch upon all aspects of financial regulation and certainly touch on all aspects of uh, the role and power of, of regulators. And I know we'll be talking through some of those issues around accountability uh, in a few minutes. Um, but I did have the opportunity to have a quick chat with uh, Wayne uh, before today's session and uh, realised that we were going to be saying a lot of things that were very similar. Um, I agree with everything that Wayne has said, so let's uh, get that on the record. Uh, so, but rather than um, uh, I was not going to attempt to list all the recommendations that uh, affected ASIC, I thought I'd take a bit of a different approach in my opening remarks and dive into one recommendation in a bit more depth because I think that will highlight some of the themes that emerged during the inquiry. And I wanted to have a bit of a discussion around the product intervention power because that has generated a bit of controversy as a proposition. So one of the recommendations in the report was for ASIC to be given a product intervention power. Uh, that's obviously one of the things currently being considered by the government as part of its consultation process, so my comments should be seen in, in that context. Uh, ASIC supported such a power in our submissions to the FSI uh, because ultimately we agree with the FSI's conclusions that uh, if well designed, this power ought to enable ASIC to be more proactive uh, and to allow for more targeted and timely intervention. And that issue of more targeted intervention I think is quite important. If you can have a regulatory tool that really allows you to uh, focus in on the areas that are causing the most problems or the most risk rather than applying the same sort of requirements right across the board on everyone irrespective of their compliance levels, you can often get much better results uh, at lower cost. There were other reasons as to why this power was seen as desirable. I'd, I'd like to mention two that I think are critical. One is that such a power would provide ASIC with regulatory options beyond disclosure. And I think one of the themes in the report uh, is that there have been some distinct limitations to disclosure as a regulatory tool in retail markets. That's been the experience uh, looking back over the years since the Wallace inquiry and that in some ways we've placed too much burden on generic disclosure requirements uh, without considering the possible use of other regulatory tools. The second I wanted to mention is that it would allow ASIC I think to more readily consider regulatory actions that address market-wide problems uh, rather than uh, a focus on individual entities or, or being able to take action just against individual entities or in relation to individual transactions. And that is a limitation on our powers at present. That would help us to make, I think, better decisions around the impacts on competition of uh, our regulatory and enforcement work, which was obviously one of the issues highlighted in the report. 
Having said this, I think that anyone who's had a look at the report will identify some tensions in the presentation of the product intervention power. Uh, it suggests that ASIC could be more proactive, but also there's a suggestion that maybe it should only be used as a last resort. So obviously there's some debate to be had as to uh, how and when uh, such a power might um, best be used. Since, uh, Kevin, that you, you raised this proposal, you and your colleagues, there's been quite a lot of commentary. Uh, not all of it I would regard as entirely on point and so I was going to use the opportunity today to briefly address uh, what I think are three misconceptions that I've seen uh, <coughs> in the public discussion of this issue. Um, the first is that this type of power, the product intervention, represents some radical new approach to, to regulation and that's uh, simply not right. Uh, we still have a heavily disclosure-based regime, but we've seen an increasing range of reforms that have <coughs> elements of what you might call product intervention uh, introduced into the Australian market. For example, FOFA, the, the prohibition on certain conflicted remuneration as part of FOFA is in a sense a form of product um, intervention. The new consumer protection provisions in the payday lending area um, include direct reg product regulation such as a cap on fees. So product intervention itself is not an alien concept but what we don't have and I think what the inquiry identified is uh, a power for the regulator to use in a timely, flexible and um, a broadly applicable fashion and I think that's, that's what the FSI has identified as a bit of a gap in the toolkit. The second uh, misconception is in effect the flip side of the first one and uh, that is that product intervention is not needed because ASIC already had such powers. Um, interestingly I've seen the same people making both arguments one and two. Uh, we don't need it because it's a radical new thing and it's going to be dangerous and we don't need it because ASIC already has the powers. Uh, which is uh, admirable intellectual flexibility, but anyway, um, ASIC does in, in some areas and to different degrees have powers that are akin to what the FSI has described as product intervention powers. However, I think anyone seriously looking at um, ASIC's toolkit would note that those sorts of existing powers are inflexible and they have distinct limitations in their coverage and application. So, uh, license conditions has been raised but there's a requirement that we individually offer a hearing before imposing a license condition on each and every in each and every instance. So uh, yes we do have some powers but they're incomplete, they haven't got the flexibility that um, I think uh, the FSI is looking for. The third misconception I'd <coughs> like to address is that product intervention is all about banning products and you would think from reading some of the commentary that that's, that's all it amounts to. Well, I would encourage you to read the FSI report <laughs> on this issue uh, because otherwise you wouldn't be making such a claim um, uh, because the report mentions actions such as amending marketing materials, changes to key terminology that might be uh, leading to poor consumer outcomes, restrictions on particular forms of distribution and, and so on. Banning a product would indeed be a rare occurrence but I would argue it's nonetheless important to have there because as a regulator having a big stick, even if it's rarely if ever used, is uh, very useful to encourage better market outcomes. ASIC's view that is, is that in most circumstances where you'd be considering these sorts of powers, um, you could address market failures without going down a banning route. So for example, uh, in the UK at the moment, the Financial Conduct Authority uh, has been looking at problems in the add-on insurance market and it has proposed a prohibition on the sale of add-on insurance products on an opt-out basis. That's where you actually have to tick the box not to get the product. But the products could still be sold and in fact almost certainly will be sold uh, on an opt-in basis where consumers uh, choose to, uh, in an informed way, to take up the product. That proposition has actually been well received by industry because it allows them to deal with what is a classic collective action problem. 
The inquiry rightly suggests that there would be need for appropriate and in fact rigorous accountability mechanisms around the use of such powers and, and ASIC agrees with that proposition were it to be introduced and that goes to, I think the FRAB in, is mentioned directly as being a body that uh, might have uh, a role in assessing ASIC's use of such powers. So I think that goes to Wayne's point about the package here, that if we have some of these new powers coming into play that give the regulators some greater discretion and flexibility, it's reasonable to expect that accountability will also be looked at uh, in the equation. Look, I want to emphasise uh, that ASIC cannot and should not fix all market problems. That's a very important point. Uh, but the FSI report and other recent inquiries have clearly highlighted that there's an expectation uh, that the regulator should uh, be more proactive uh, and that a regulator with the right powers could help reduce consumer detriment and in particular could help address some of the problems that emerge before they blow out into something that becomes quite damaging. This expectation, frankly, cannot be met with the current regulatory toolkit. And I think ASIC, oh, sorry, the FSI recognised that. Look, ASIC has a track record through its own reports in identifying market failures. The problem at times has been that we have not had the toolkit to adequately deal with them. So while it's not a magic solution, a product intervention power I think would be a very useful addition to ASIC's toolkit along with some of the other reforms to ASIC's powers that are proposed in the FSI. Okay, well I suppose with that one of the, one of the things that's interesting in the FSI report is there is an acceptance uh, of an argument that has been consistently put forward by ASIC that uh, there needs to be a significant strengthening of uh, the penalty regime. Uh, that we need to look at um, raising the level of fines, having a capacity for disgorgement of profits, uh, introducing fines to a, a much greater level. Uh, now, the FSI report is specific about this and says, yes, we should increase the level of fines, but as to how much, well, we don't know, but not as much as America. Right. So, so where, where is ASIC going to put the pressure back on, on government now because it does have an opportunity because the FSI has not said what the level should be? What do you think should be the le optimum level of fine? Uh, <laughs> well, I'm uh, not sure that ASIC has come out and said this is exactly where the level should be, but rather we need a serious examination of this issue, in effect an in inquiry looking at uh, what uh, appropriate penalties should be in our uh, jurisdiction. I can remember sim similar arguments a few years ago when I was at uh, the ACCC working with uh, Graham Samuel who's here today. You have to have serious penalties as part of the overall framework if you're going to have in place some of the incentives that help you drive better culture. My, in my view, uh, if you want to get cultural change, then that's inextricably linked to the incentives that are there in the system. And one of the incentives that's there is uh, what possible consequences do I face, should I face, if uh, I engage in misconduct, if uh, something goes very badly wrong. And that's where we've identified that there needs to be a serious look at this issue. As to exactly where that's the case, I, I do think that's not something where we should be making sort of, uh, you know, stabs in the dark. I think it's something that warrants uh, a, a proper examination, uh, potentially by some sort of independent panel, which is, I think, really what the FSI was getting to on this issue. Yeah, look, if I could follow that up, I think, and this is a personal view, but that realistically we have to think about, in a sense, the probability of people being being identified and, and caught, if you like, mm. as well as the penalties, because it's, it's clearly the combination of those two mm. that matter. If you had really, really extreme penalties, then maybe ASIC <coughs> needs very few resources. <laughs> On the other hand, if you know, the penalties are very low, then you perhaps need to put more effort into uh, the, the actual identification and, uh, uh, well, capture's not the right word, but, uh, 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 identifying the people who need to be uh, punished. So it's, I, don't, I think Peter's right, you can't come up with a number. It's got to be done in the context of an assessment of what do we actually need to try and create a deterrent effect uh, to stop uh, misdemeanours and so on. 
One of the things that, uh, that comes out of the, the FSR report is the importance of, of culture. Uh, the word culture is used 31 times, ethics is used twice, maybe that tells you something, maybe, uh, maybe not. Um, but it's also really clear when you look at through your, your introduction of the concept of fairness in the report, you highlight that it's important that, that the markets are seen to be fair because otherwise that might warrant further intervention. So it's a negative definition of why fairness is required. Uh, that's one element, I guess. I, I, I would like to think that part of the rationale of, of, for fairness is that it, it should be a desirable objective in its own right. Okay. That, that people do take fairness into account in general in their decisions and that if you've got the but, but you can have institutional structures mm -hmm. that, that lead to it being completely ignored. Mm -hmm. uh, and that gets back to the issue of culture, which you just mentioned. Mm -hmm. So I whose responsibility it, is it then to ensure that the financial markets uh, participants in actual fact operate within a culture of fairness? Yes, and I, and I think the, <coughs> again, I, I guess what I was, I'd go back to the economics textbooks almost and say, we believe that markets work well. We believe that mar well can can work well, and, and we want them to work well. But we base that assumption on the fact that everybody undertakes a trade where they believe it's bilaterally beneficial. I trade with you uh, because I think we're both going to benefit out of it. The problem, of course, in financial markets is there is so much in the way of information asymmetry and so on that unless you have a, the, the case where I feel confident that you're not just trying to screw me. Um, then the, the, the willingness of people to engage in trade breaks down and you've got the, the general problems of spillovers of if some participants uh, are not trustworthy, can I be sure the other ones are trustworthy? Uh, one of the issues that, that, that worries, I mean, worries me in financial markets is that you can easily get the race to the bottom. Um, that basically for someone to stay in business they've got to, you know, They've got to match the people that are undercutting mm. them, and that may mean they cut corners as well. The, the trouble with all of this is the culture is not something you can regulate for. Right. I mean, that's very laudable, but um, I suppose if you look at a lot of the things that have been happening internationally post the crisis, whether it be LIBOR, whether it be the manipulation of financial benchmarks, what you're seeing is activity that continued long after the financial crisis and indeed long after the individual banks were being bailed out and in the case of RBS after it had been taken into state ownership right so there had been a stated commitment to cultural change but in actual fact that wasn't followed through in practice so the question is how do you ensure warranted commitment to cultural change maybe Ooh. <laughs> I, I don't think you can guarantee it. Right. Uh, there, there is, I mean, there are very few things in life that are guaranteed. Well, how do you work uh, towards and, it? So, I, I mean, I think we we are working towards it. I've I've said elsewhere. I think one of the um, we think about all of the changes that are being made to the regulatory framework post the GFC, and and if we take things that are in my responsibility, particularly the bank capital framework, has been substantially strengthened. There's now a great focus on resolution frameworks for banks. Can, can we make those stronger? Um, but these are still all, if you like, the safety net. Mm. You would much rather have bank management, bank boards run themselves in a way that's much more focused on long-term long sustainability than uh, can I meet my earnings target for the next quarter or something. Um, ultimately, if we're to avoid these problems repeating, cultural change is actually at the heart of it. And I would agree entirely with what Peter said, incentives are at the heart of cultural change. And, and so I think that's where we have to look. I don't, so want, to, I don't want to suggest that that means regulators have to start setting prescriptive incentive frameworks, but um, certainly, we are now prodding and trying to push people to look harder at these issues. So it's more invasive supervision? I wouldn't call it invasive, <laughs> um, but I would call it focused and more intensive. And substantial. Look, look, some of it yeah. is 
I'm not sure that invasive is the right word, uh, Justin, but I, I think, again, that issue around incentives is important here. And if there's one, to pick up one of the recommendations from uh, the report, or one of the issues that's discussed in the report, not a, not a huge uh, uh, one, but um, it goes to the current powers that are available to ASIC in relation to, say, taking action uh, in cases of poor financial or advice or non-compliant financial advice, where we have much greater ability to take action against the frontline advisor, but it's much more difficult for us to take action against the manager or the executive who's responsible for running that business. Mm -hmm. Now, that, I think, is um, a problem in the sort of structural incentive uh, for getting, uh, getting the culture right because you can wash your hands of the frontline mm. advisor, um, but uh, for the person who was responsible for setting up the arrangements and the training and the remuneration and all that sort of thing, uh, there hasn't been nearly as straightforward to take action there. So I think the recommendation, for example, to give ASIC greater ability to ban managers and executives provides a bit of, of an incentive. Having said that, uh, it's critical, and this is a point that we've been making recently, that the industry understands and accepts that they can't just rely on the regulators to lift culture and to fix culture. There has to be an acceptance on the part of uh, financial institutions and financial players themselves that they have a vitally important role to play here. Otherwise, we'll end up with, I think, quite dysfunctional and costly regulatory outcomes. And do you see evidence uh, within the Australian marketplace that the financial institutions are willing to actually do that? I think uh, for in, in ASIC's space, I think the uh, debates that have taken place over the last few years, say in the financial advice area, uh, have been a big wake-up call and uh, a clearly to caught, well, to the, uh, to the financial advice firms, uh, to the firms that are in that business, and uh, there, there's a lot of thought going on to matters ranging from how they can better ensure that they're reporting breaches or instances of misconduct to how they can ensure better professional standards. There's a road to travel, mm. there's a lot to be worked through, but um, uh, I think that has obviously helped change the, the discussion. Okay, let's open it up to the, the, the wider audience here. Um, we've got some roving microphones wandering around. If somebody's got a question, we can <coughs> open it up. Uh, Dominic Kingsford. Thank Timothy Kingsford Smith from the Law Faculty at UNSW. And um, can I address this question to um, uh, Peter and Kevin? It's about product intervention powers. <laughs> Unsurprising. Yes. Okay. Can I ask, they're called product intervention powers. That's the way we've come to dis uh, describe them in Australia. But a lot of what was said in the consumer outcomes chapter of the FSI report did talk about the products and the distribution uh, uh, mechanisms. And distribution didn't particularly uh, include or exclude advice. Now, in the United Kingdom, where the thinking about product interventions are being progressed further down the line, the empowerment that the FCA has there is to intervene in contracts contracts between financial providers who are authorised and others. It doesn't specify function. It doesn't specify product design. It doesn't specify direct distribution. And it doesn't specify advisory contracts. And my question to both of you is, what exactly do you mean by product intervention powers? How wide do you anticipate they might be? Um, I th I think from the inquiry's perspective, we, again, we were trying to set principles rather than precise details. So I can probably fudge you know, my answer to that question by saying we didn't want to get into those great details, but if, if it were generally agreed that this was a, a suitable way of approaching a, a, a perceived, well, an actual problem, uh, let's get agreement and then the details can be worked out. 
Uh, I think it's worth saying that, you know, in the context of, you know, this seems like an increase in regulation, which of course is not what the, the Treasurer in commissioning the inquiry w was after. Um, but I, I think it's very important to, to make the point that you would hope this is used rarely, and it would only be used in that in that very in the very specific cases. So it shouldn't be something that reputable institutions should should be concerned about. You would hope they're not going to be a situation of bringing products to the market uh, that are not suitable for the for the target group. So by having something that is directed and giving ASIC very specific powers to act in cases where they see it is an issue. Uh, Specific regulation is better than some blanket regulation that affects everybody and uh, and, and and may not uh, may not be may not be appreciated. So I think that's that's sort of where uh, where we were coming from. Yes. Uh, look, sorry to disappoint you, Dimitri, but I don't think we have a a highly detailed model in mind at this point uh, in time. The discussions are still taking place, and obviously there's a lot of thinking going into this. Um, in some ways, uh, if, if your point though was, is the phrase product intervention in some ways in itself not entirely helpful because you might also be wanting to look at uh, some, having some controls over distribution in some cases, uh, the product itself might be fine, it's just that the distribution is working in such a way that it's getting to completely the wrong people. Um, then that's something that we would potentially envisage being captured. Um, but I, I agree with, with Kevin, it's, it's not something that uh, we envisaged would um, end up being some sort of day-to-day -day proposition, but would be useful, I think, in those cases where you often have a collective action problem, where you've got firms that are engaged in a race to the bottom. In many cases, we find that they recognise they're in a race to the bottom, and they want some sort of trigger or ability to break that that they themselves can't provide. And I think those things come up from time to time and that is a potentially useful uh, area for, for this power. Uh, I think that goes back to, to uh, Hector Sands, who was a, a former head of the Financial Services Authority, who in 2009 talked about the need for uh, uh, intervention much earlier in the in the cycle, so at, at at product design stage, to look at you know the roles and the responsibilities of the market participants in upholding market integrity by designing these project products in the first place, uh, and he capped that with a notion of going to Kevin's point about principles by saying that he firmly believed in principles-based regulation, but it only works with people who have principles, right? <laughs> so if they don't have the principles, it's not gonna work, right? Uh, and I think that's, a, that's, a, that's more than a facetious comment, it's a very serious comment, because ultimately the integrity of the market is actually only going to operate if you've got a combination of rules, principles, and social norms. And what the crisis and its aftermath has demonstrated to us, I think very clearly, is that the social norms of industry has to change. There has to be a commitment by industry for that. And I suppose nudging is perhaps the best way that can be achieved. So it's not the, necessarily the application of the banning, it is the, the dialogue that you facilitate about basically certain kinds of behaviors are just not acceptable. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, another question here, yes, Kingsley. Uh, Kingsley Jones, uh, question for, for Peter. Um, Following on, uh, just having had a bit of a scan of some of the uh, submissions uh, last night, uh, and one, one thing that struck me about the ASIC one was the, the piece in there about widening the consideration of what ASIC's goal was to include competition. Um, and so to frame my question, it really is also a follow-on from what Justin just mentioned. Um, you know, in the context of innovation, uh, we're seeing a lot of new business models now are being put forward. So in the session that I ran before, peer-to-peer -peer lending was one such example. And uh, so it strikes me that obviously with those new business models, they are part of the competitive landscape. Uh, it would seem foolish to try to eliminate them altogether, uh, either by design or by accident. Um, um, it would perhaps be preferable to encourage and guide their development in some kind of consultative process. So, um, you know, this product intervention, and I think the, you know, the more upstream form of that, which we just heard from Justin, is product consultation when startup businesses, new businesses, different business models within our old existing businesses start to get framed and 
you know, the people at the coalface have to answer this question, what would ASIC's view be of this web delivery model for financial advice, for example? Um, hmm. So what are your views um, on how we solve that problem of making product intervention more consultative and more around the origin of the idea? Uh, okay. Um, I don't think that to be clear that that, what I understand exactly what you're talking about, but I'm not sure that that's where you'd apply the so-called product intervention um, power. Really what you're talking about there is ensuring that uh, a regulator like ASIC is, um, in effect, has the skills, capacity and the interaction with industry to ensure that the way we apply the law is not inhibiting um, new innovations, is not inhibiting uh, new competitors from coming on board uh, and is not inadvertently um, stopping some of the developments that we'd like to see in new technologies or whatnot in, in the marketplace. And th that is uh, a really important um, issue for, for us. It's something uh, where I hope it doesn't come as a surprise to this audience. We are having very regular meetings with the people that operate in, in that space. Um, I think uh, one of the um, issues that your point there highlights is that tension between flexibility and certainty in the rule kit. Um, and uh, I can remember a few years ago talking to someone from one of the largest uh, industry associations who said slightly flippantly, look, Peter, all that industry wants from ASIC is two things, complete certainty and complete flexibility. Uh, and that would, uh, that would solve all our problems. Uh, and so <laughs> it would be a little less flippant for a moment. I, I think what the, the line we try to walk all the time, and uh, I suspect Wayne's in the, the same position, is how do you ensure that you're not allowing, for example, a new entrant to ignore the rules that others have to abide by, um, but that you're also not applying those rules in such a way that you're inhibiting innovation. And I think um, the report itself has identified the need to devote a lot more thinking um, around that, including around the capacity of regulators to keep up with what's going on there. Uh, I, I think it's worth just following that up, that uh, there are a couple of uh, recommendations in there. I picked up this very valuable piece of paper here that uh, uh, Sifa should be congratulated on. I was going to stick it on the wall at home. Um, recommendation 14 was about a technological um, uh, collaborative, a yeah. collaborative committee to make it, I guess, better understood what innovations were coming, how they might be implemented and so on, what the issues are. There's another recommendation, um, uh, 39 I think it was, uh, which includes making sure that legislation is technologically neut neutral. So there are, there's a number of things in that area that, that I think are relevant to, to that issue of new, new products which involve potentially great benefits but also can introduce new risks. And of course one of the issues I think for innov innovators in all of this is you've probably got to deal with three or four different regulators and government departments and, and, and that's one of the complications that, uh, uh, that, that needs to be looked at. Wayne, do you want to come in? No. no. Okay, this question at the back here. Um, hi there, James Ayres from the Financial Re Review. Um, it's a question for Mr. Byers. Um, and it relates to the first chapter of, of the report um, about resilience. Um, there are a number of recommendations in, in, in that part of the report, including um, one that said that the banks should um, maintain levels of capital or equity that, that make them unquestionably strong, put them in the top quartile of global banks. And also um, a second recommendation relating to the risk weightings that were being applied by the big banks to their mortgage books and, and calling for those to be um, increased, um, which would have the result of increasing the uh, equity that banks would, um, would be holding against their mortgages. I was just wondering if you, um, if you could uh, let us know uh, how you were thinking about those recommendations in light of some um, fast-moving international developments at the uh, Baal committee level. Uh, we're thinking about them very hard. <laughs> um, so they're, they're quite important uh, recommendations, obviously. I don't think they were one and two just out of random selection that they were um, high on the list of recommendations. Uh, 
Um, <clears throat> but to your point, they're not recommendations that can be thought about in isolation of what is happening internationally. There are, um, as much as we would like it not to be so, there is still a lot of movement in the international regulatory bodies, um, the standard setting bodies. So the ground is moving on us somewhat and it's hard to settle on some of those things without having at least a clearer sense of what the destination for some of those international reforms might be. I think directionally the FSI recommendations and the ideas that are floating around in the, in the international bodies are all heading in the same direction. They're not, they're not mutually um, exclusive from one another or they're not, certainly not going to conflict with one another. Um, but they're not necessarily the same in detail and so we need to give quite a lot of thought to how we bring all these things together given one of the other things that, I th that, that wasn't an uh, explicit recommendation but it was certainly in the FSI report was the importance of Australian financial institutions being able to demonstrate that they do meet these international standards and, and for access to <coughs> international financial markets which a number of the speakers this morning highlighted was very important for this country. Uh, we need to make sure we seem to be meeting those international standards. We also need to make sure uh, they're as appropriate as they can be made for, for the local conditions. So to come back to the point, we're thinking hard. Um, we haven't said a lot about it quite deliberately at this point because we're keen to see what comes out of the consultation process which is underway at present. Um, we'll see what that consultation process delivers and then, um, then we'll have more to say about how we take that forward. But it would also be the case that Australian regulators, both prudential and market conduct, have quite a significant role to play in the design of those international standards, not least because your own prior experience and the experience of Greg Minecraft as chair of IOSCO. Yeah, I think, um, I think Australia has a good track record in influencing these things. Um, if, you look at, uh, if you look at the liquidity coverage ratio, which is part of the Basel III package, there's a very explicit component of that which is Australian driven. It wouldn't be there if it wasn't for, for in particular, John Laker and Glenn Stevens saying we have to have this to make the framework work. So um, it's not always as obvious as that, but I think my, my observation when I was sitting with a neutral hat on was Australia carried a lot of weight in these discussions and that, that was to our benefit, to great benefit. Okay, we have one more. Valentin Panchenko, uh, UNSW Business School. So there is a big international debate on CEO and manager's compensation and uh, in particular there is a view that some of the practices are geared towards risk uh, uh, risk-oriented decisions and short-term uh, gains. So uh, in Australia, the debate is not that big on this issue, but I'm wondering if uh, FSI had any deliberations on this. And uh, so that's a question to Kevin. And the question to regulators, whether they see any role. So in a way, it's a changing of culture and interfering in the organization and if they're ready to go a little bit deeper into this. Uh, we talked about everything, so we must have talked about <laughs> that. Um, but yes, no, I mean, that was clearly an important issue, the extent to which remuneration packages give rise to ad, you know, inappropriate risk incentives and so on. But I guess we you know, kept coming back to the, the issue that ultimately you can't regulate for culture, you probably can't regulate for remuneration structures uh, or incentive structures, and I think, you know, this is where I handball it to Wayne, uh, I think we were reasonably comfortable that, that APRA has an approach where you at least look at the remuneration uh, structures uh, to see whether they're consistent with prudent management of the banks. And that's, a, in a sense, an indirect way of trying to achieve the outcome that you would like, that you're not getting those adverse incentives. Over to you. <laughs> yeah. Um, <coughs> So it's, it's a fair point. I, I think we started, we in Australia started uh, with a position uh, to say that whatever you think about remuneration arrangements in the Australian financial system, uh, 
we didn't have the excesses or the extremes that necessarily existed in, in some other jurisdictions. Uh, so we didn't quite have uh, the same problem to grapple with. But we did, um, we did in, I can't remember which year it was, 2009 or 10, we did introduce some new standards around remuneration. They are principles-based standards, quite deliberately principles-based standards, because it's not, it's, it's not, I don't think, I think it's a, a dangerous path to go down for regulators to start to get terribly prescriptive on how individual organisations choose to pay and reward their people. Uh, but nonetheless, it does set out some important principles that are designed to align uh, remuneration and risk return considerations and, and, in a sense, try and make sure that people were, in deciding how they were going to structure incentives for people, they were factoring in risks being taken into that assessment uh, and that performance was considered over a sufficient time period such that risk could actually be observed and, and, and uh, if d you could see whether that risk had actually realised or not. Um, but it's still a very principles-based framework and as I said, I think that's probably the right balance for us to strike. Yeah, I remember uh, going back to 2008, going and uh, speaking to Bill McDonough, his former head of the New York Fed Reserve, um, uh, who at the time was um, working for as an advisor to the Merrill Lynch board. And uh, I, I went to see him in New York, and I said, "Well, you know, we're told we, we've got this ma new master liquidity in instrument. You know, and the crisis is contained; it's manageable. You know, what do you think? Where are we?" And he said, "Well, I don't think we're on the first corner." Yet this is, mark my words, this is a market of incendiary toxicity. Uh, and it, it really struck me as being like really, for a former central banker to describe the state of the market in 2008, the international markets in 2008 as one of incendiary toxicity, really demonstrated how serious the crisis is. I suppose from the international perspective, after all of this intervention that we've seen, uh, have we actually solved any of the root causes of the 2008 crisis, Wim? Uh, <laughs> I'd like to think we've solved a few. Otherwise, um, uh, otherwise, we've put a lot of effort in for nothing. Mm. Um, but and and uh, you know, a crisis of the magnitude that we had very rarely does anything like that have a single cause. There's mm. multiple causes, multiple influences that sort of compound together and create a big problem, each individual cause might in and of itself mm. seem reasonable risk to run, but put together you've, you've created um, something much more severe. So clearly um, the banking system was too fragile, it's now much more resilient. Um, regulatory powers have been strengthened. There's lots of things, lots of more structured safety nets mm. being put in place for the financial system for whenever the next time we have a crisis, but I, I would come back to the point I made before. Um, the way that you reduce the probability of that crisis is primarily by getting institutions to run themselves better, be more risk aware, be more, have a more longer term perspective, think about how am I here on a sustainable basis for the long term. Um, it, you can't expect the regulators to come along and just ensure everything will be okay. if if industry doesn't choose to take that uh, and, and do something itself. I, I started this with uh, a comment from uh, HSBC. I think we're an interesting time. We're going to have to close with this. Uh, but in, uh, if you look at the HSBC website, basically the last speech on that website dates from August 2014 from the chairman, Douglas Flint, who says it was time for the regulators to give bankers a second chance. <laughs> Perhaps, perhaps not. Uh, we're unconscious we're out of time. It's uh, 2 p.m., but I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Wynne, to Peter, and to Kevin. Thank you very much indeed.